Christmas slide. And so last week we, we began talking about the Gifts of Christmas sermon series. And we talked about how the, the big gift that is given to us at Christmas is the gift of eternal life. But in that gift, there are four things that we're going to unpack beginning last week and continuing today that are a part, Chad, can you hit no BKG, thank you, that are a part of the Christmas uh, atmosphere that we choose to celebrate and hang in our hearts. And we talked about how just like a Christmas tree, we hang ornaments that showcase what the tree is for, because there's last week we had a tree in the back with no ornaments on it, right? And it wasn't lit up. And you just looked at it and you're like, are you going to do anything with that tree? Right? That's what many of you thought. Are you just going to leave it like that? Um, no. We hang things on it to showcase the purpose of the tree, right? Yep. And you look at it now and you're like, wow, that's a, that's a beautiful tree, just like the rest of our facilities. So for those of you who helped do that, thank you so much. It looks beautiful in here. Um, it really does. So thank you. Thank you. And um, but the purpose of it is a Christmas tree. And so a tree, a pine tree just sitting in the back of the sanctuary would be really weird, right? But it's a Christmas tree. And so as followers of Jesus, our life has purpose and our life has meaning, and we should showcase that purpose. And so last week we talked about an ornament we need to hang in our heart and in our life is the gift of love. The gift of love needs to be received from us, I'm sorry, to us from Jesus, and then it's a gift that we need to send out to others as well. Amen. And this morning, we, I, I want to highlight the main premise that we're talking about with the gifts of Christmas, and that we're talking about the purpose of Christmas, not just the event of Christmas. Christmas is not just about a manger, it's about a cross. Christmas is about a Savior. Yeah. Christmas is about so much more than just a moment. Yeah. It's about eternity. That's what Christmas is about. And so we talked about four things. We talked about how we all have sinned. We've all messed up. We've all chosen to sin against God. Number two was death is the price for our sin. Death is the price for the fact that we've sinned. Number three was Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus paid the price for our sin. And then number four was the gift of eternal life. That was the four main points that are the premise for everything here. Understanding again in Matthew 1, 21, the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth was to save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And last week we ended our sermon, our sermon in John chapter 15 where we talked about how Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than to lay one's life down for their friends. And Jesus says, you know, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Jesus is basically foreshadowing the fact that he will give his life because he loves his disciples, he loves us. But before all that he says, love one another. Love each other as I have loved you. And that was our big point last week. And then today, what we're going to do is we're going to go back just a little bit more in John chapter 15. And we're going to be in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 5. Some of you are going to understand where we're going here pretty quick. But I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. Done for you, sorry. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. That's a good recap for last week, right? And then it continues on. If you, com if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for your word. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds today. God, that you would pierce through the darkness God, that we've allowed to permeate ourselves and may you shine through so that we can see the things that hold back our joy so that your joy can permeate our life. And you know, I pray, amen. 
So again, like, like ornaments on a tree, joy is what we're talking about today. And so I love that my wife never moved love last week, which means she didn't listen to my sermon, and that's okay. I forgive her. And uh, she was sick last week. Sorry, she listens to me talk all the time. And um, you actually read, oh, you did read my sermon before I preached it, so you did. So you wouldn't know that side point. But joy is the thing that we are to hang in our hearts this Christmas season, but throughout our life. You know, and what we're going to unpack today is what joy is, how is joy realized, and kind of, how do I say this? Why it's so important. You know, when we, when we read this passage of Scripture, it begins with, I am the vine, you are the branches. And again, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples at the end of his life. The tragedy of the cross is about to come. The beauty of the cross is about to take place. And Jesus is choosing to speak about joy. What's amazing about gets to his death, the more he talks about joy. It's almost as if Jesus understands that joy shines brightest and strongest, not when things are good, but when things are not good. I and mean, let's, let's just be real. When somebody's full of joy because everything's going on in their life, you just go, congratulations. Like, congrats, like, good for you. Like, I'm, I'm happy that your life is going well. But when somebody's, all the circumstances of their life are against them, <clears throat> and yet they stand firm, and they still got that smile on their face. Yeah. They still say, nothing's going to knock me down. Amen. What is, that's, I mean, that's joy. Amen. That's unexplainable, uncontainable joy. And that is what Jesus is talking about. When The closer he gets to tragedy, the more his joy shines forth. And notice the words that he uses with his disciples. He says, so that my joy may be in you. The first thing I want to highlight today is it's his joy. It's his joy. Joy. It's not your joy. Why? Because our joy is going to pass and fade away. Our joy is not going to last. I don't know about you, but like I talked about last week, Christmas morning only lasts for a few days or lasts for a few hours or even minutes because our joy does not last. <clears throat> but the joy of the Lord, Amen. it endures Amen. because it's his joy. It's his joy. So Jesus tells his disciples to re remain in relationship with him. He says, stay tied to the vine. You are a branch. You must stay tied to me. Why? Because the joy is his. How can we ha allow the fruit of the Spirit, one of them being joy, to permeate, to shine forth in our life if we're not tied to the vine. It's not going to happen. We are just a branch that is broken off from the vine. And a branch that is broken off from the vine will not produce fruit. Listen, if your joy has been taken away from you, then what you're saying is Jesus has been taken away from you. I'll say it one more time. If you're saying your joy has been taken away from you, you're saying that Jesus has been taken away from you. Why? Because it's his joy. Yeah. Now, one of the things you have to understand about joy is it's okay in your joy to feel sadness. It's okay in your joy to feel pain. Joy is unexplainable. Because I don't know about you, but I've, I've had really rough moments in my life. I mean, when you, when you lose a grandparent, I haven't lost a parent, I've lost a grandparent. And the, the pain, you know, my family was really close. We saw our grandparents at least once a month minimum. Classic. He does, he does. Classic. There's one thing I can't stand is uniting politics in the church, but anyway. So here's the, here's the reality of what I'm trying to talk about here. In my pain, I was okay. In my pain, there was still joy. Why? Because in my loss, I understand that there was still something to come. Right? In, in, 
when, when things go poorly in our life, there's joy in understanding Romans 8.28, and we know that he works all things together for the good of those who love him. Amen. So I can still have joy in a hard time understanding that something else is on the horizon. So I don't have to stay down here in the dumps because the dumps are just a season to pass through. One of the, I love this quote, and multiple pastors have used it, is that, you know, when you're walking through hell, don't stop. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> right? When you're walking through hell, don't stop. What do you do? You just keep walking. You just keep walking. A lot of people, they hit a terrible circumstance in their life, and they just stop. And they're like, oh man, I'm just going to stay here in this pain and misery forever. No, you keep walking. Keep moving. And so when, when we talk about the joy, the first thing I want us to understand that just like love, joy is a gift that must be accepted and received. It's not something that's just forced upon you. That's the amazing thing about the Christian life. It's not like Jesus comes and forces me to do anything. But I get to accept the joy that he provides for me. And so as we, as we unpack this gift of joy, there's, again, Jesus spoke more about joy the closer he got to the cross. You want to know when your joy is going to shine the brightest is in your hardest seasons. Why? Because the world, when they go through hard times, they lose everything. But as a follower of Jesus, you can always have joy because there's always something on the horizon. This world is not the end. Your story is just, I mean, you're in the middle of your story, folks. Amen. And I don't know if you've ever read a really good story. It's not all good. Why? Because the best stories have highs and lows, yep. but they always end on a high. Yeah. As we can, I mean, it, <clears throat> it's not only a gift from God, but as you, as you look back on that verse, what does it say? It says, so I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. Your joy may be complete. That means it's whole, it's full, it's not lacking. John 17, 13 says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Jesus praying over his disciples, he says, so that, my, so that they may have a full measure of joy within them. My second point today is his joy makes us whole. His joy makes us whole. I, I mean, have you ever been in a season, and we've all been in these seasons, let's just be honest, where you just feel like you're inadequate. Don't raise your hand. You don't need to, because everybody, everybody would raise their hand, right? Yeah. You feel inadequate. You feel like you don't got enough. You feel like, you know what, I've tried and tried and tried, and there's just nothing I can do. What is, what is the, but it, it's his joy. And, I mean, you, you hear this phrase all the time. It's found in the scriptures. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And we, when we stay, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a, we're walking here, okay? So I'm going to have to walk all the way through it here. He's the vine. I'm the branch. That's step one. Step two, if I want to see joy permeated throughout my life, if I want to receive that joy, I must stay tied to the vine. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> we're good so far. His joy makes me feel whole. Okay, because it makes me feel whole, his joy is my strength. Yeah. Now, it all comes back to it's his joy. So when we, when we walk through our life, this is, this is the, man, this is a beautiful picture right here. On Wednesday night, we talked about Samson. And Samson, when he was, he, he had just killed a bunch of Philistines. We're talking a thousand Philistines, okay? And Samson is thirsty, he's not doing well, and Samson prays this ridiculous prayer to God, and he says, God, in my strength, I just slaughtered a thousand Philistines. What are you, like, are you going to let me die now? Why don't you just give me some water to drink? Okay, what you read in the scriptures is that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he killed a thousand Philistines. That's what the scriptures say. But Samson goes, in my strength, I slaughtered a thousand Philistines. 
Now, now, when in your heart and in your mind, do you go, I did this? If you're going, I did this, then what you're saying is your joy is your strength. And I'll tell you right now, if your joy is your strength, when you are going to fail, because you will fail, you're going to feel inadequate. You're going to feel like you're not good enough. You're going to feel like you aren't going to make it. But if the joy of the Lord is your strength, when things go well, you say, I know my God has it and I know my God did it. And then when things don't go well, you go, you know what? It doesn't matter because God was in charge of the harvest anyway. It's just my responsibility to sow. It's my responsibility to work. And my God is the one in charge of the harvest. Man. And this is, so what does Paul say? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, he says, be joyful always. Be joyful always. Well, how do we be joyful always? We stay tied to the vine. We spend time with Jesus. I mean, we all, I shouldn't say we all know, but there's a very common song sung in church to little children. Pray your Bible, read every day, and read, sorry, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. I mean, we've heard this story, right? We've heard this song. And it's such a simple song, such a simple jingle, and yet it's so profound and so powerful. And, you know, one of the things, I've, I've talked with a few people, and like, you know, I read my Bible, and I don't feel like I'm, I'm getting anything out of it. And I go, well, you're just reading your Bible. So you see, this is, and this is the problem with the, the nursery jingle, is that when we hear the nursery jingle, we go, read your Bible, pray every day. And so what we do is we just check the box. So I open my Bible, I read a chapter, I open my Bible, read two, I mean, you could read ten chapters. But if you're reading the Bible the way you read a novel, well, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Why? Because you're not actually trying to have an encounter with the Savior of the world. Right. So when you read your Bible, you stop as you're reading the Bible, and you go, man, what does that mean for me? Because the Bible is a conversation between you and God. Oh, did you hear that? The Bible is a conversation between you and God. It's not just a one-way street. It's a two-way street. It's an opportunity. You can't change the Word, but you have to allow the Word to change you. And so, as we, as we continue through this, okay, his, his, it's His joy. You know, he's in charge of the harvest. And so his joy is my strength. His joy makes me whole. And I don't know about you, but when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling adequate, when I'm feeling whole and complete because of the joy of the Lord, it doesn't matter the results. It doesn't matter the results. And, you know, last, yesterday we had this amazing thing. And this is, I didn't mention it. And I want to mention it now. Yesterday we had Christmas free here at the church. And, um, you know, we've been doing this for a few years um, by a few, I mean more than a few, but we've doing it, we've been doing this for years, and uh, we decided this year we we're going to do most of our advertising on Facebook um, just to see what would happen. And um, we, so my wife added, I added, I said 235, it's around 240 people were blessed yesterday through Christmas free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that is a, an amazing thing, and you know, you know, I don't mean to call you out, but this is Glenna's heart and idea from the beginning. And to see, and she, what is, I know Glenna's heart. She goes, no, this was God led me to do this. And when I look at all of you in the room, I go, what is, what is God leading you to? What is God leading you to? Because here's, here's, a, here's a big deal, and this is, this is a huge reality. <clears throat> if God's leading you to do something, if 10 people showed up yesterday for Christmas free, I would have been okay with it because it's God's. If 500 people showed up yesterday, it's awesome because it's God's. I mean, it's, it's all his, you know? And so when you are tied to the vine, when he is your strength because of the joy that he gives you, the results then are up to him and they're not in your hands, which is such a burden off your back. Amen, right? That you don't have to worry about those results. I mean, look at, let's look at Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, which if you ever feel bad about yourself, just pick up Habakkuk and feel good again. <clears throat> Habakkuk says this. Thank you for laughing. The big tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. 
you may have nothing to your name. And that's basically what Habakkuk is saying. <laughs> we got nothing. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because there's always something on the horizon with God. Your, your bad moment is not the end of your story. You can make it, but I'm telling you don't. That would be really foolish. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. And I don't know about you, but it's a wake-up call for me. No one in this room walked to church today, right? We got more to our name than Habakkuk did. Things may not look great, and there may be trouble in your household, but you are all alive with breath in your lungs. And the same power, and the same power, I'm going to say one more time, and the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Do you understand? The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And so guess what? The same joy that, oh, get this, the same joy that carried Jesus Christ throughout his life through the cross in his resurrection lives in you. You catch that? It's his joy. And it's his joy that he gives to you. And that joy that he endured, like, his joy lives in us. Verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah of the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. We have to understand something about shepherds. Shepherds were not looked fondly upon. Did you know that? I mean, shepherds were not looked fondly upon. They were looked down on. Many of them were known as thieves. Many of them were thieves. <laughs> and they smelled real bad, hanging out with some sheep. This is, this is who the angels appear to on the night that Christ was born. On the night Christ was born, the angels don't show up to the innkeeper. They don't show up to the mayor. They don't show up to the head of the synagogue. They show up to a bunch of shepherds, and they say, I bring you good news. What's the good news? Jesus. Jesus is the good news. So they're saying, hey, I bring you good news. I'm bringing you Jesus. The Savior of the world has been born tonight. And what does it say? It will cause or it will bring great joy. Church, if you want to know why you don't have enough joy, it's because you forget about your Savior. You forget about who you were. You forget about what you did. I don't know about you, but when I look back on my life, I have all the reason for joy because I was broken, I was messed up, I was stupid, but Jesus came and saved me. And so I can have joy every day because of what he's done for me. Every day because of what he's done for me. I have joy for eternity because it's his joy that he gave to me that began on a Christmas evening, a silent night. He brought joy to the world. Amen. He brought joy to the world. <coughs> joy is not found in the circumstances of our day. Joy is not found in the people that we know other than Jesus Christ. Joy is found in an eternal God who loves you, who has a plan for your life, who always has something new and bright on the horizon. And obviously, there are also times bad things on the horizon. But King David says, though my sorrow may last for the night, my what? My joy. My joy. What is David referring to? Jesus. 
David was before Jesus. We endure nights, but our, no, our joy is not just found in the morning. Our joy is found in the darkness because our God is in the darkness. Our God is with us wherever we go. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Last week we talked about how we must love each other as God has loved us. Today I share with you that in order for the world to see and accept Jesus for who he is, we must live a life full of joy. We must live a life full of joy joy. Have you ever been around a religious person who's just miserable all the time? You can raise your hand for this. We, we right? There's so many rules. Most of those people don't like me. I'm just going to be real with you. Why? I mean, there's so many different rules, right? You can't wear jeans on a Sunday morning. Well, you know what? If you want your pastor comfortable and preaching the way he does, the pastor's going to wear pants that he feels good in. You know, if you don't want your pastor... Um, getting angry on the, in the morning because his ingrown toenails, because um, I get them all the time. That's why I wear sneakers. I wear a wide sneaker because I don't want to get ingrown toenails. I've had over, I've had, is it 10? I think I'm up to 10 ingrown toenail surgeries. That's why I wear sneakers. Okay? But what happens in religion is that we make up all these rules and we say, if we don't follow these rules, well, everything's not going to be okay. Real funny is that people who have a lot of rules never have a lot of joy. <laughs> right? Right? Why? Because people who have a lot of rules are trying to do what? What are people who, are, what are people who have a lot of rules, what are they trying to do? They're trying to earn. They're trying to earn. They're trying to earn their salvation. They're trying to earn acceptance. They're trying to earn love. But what Christmas teaches us is that we can't earn the love of God. We can't earn our joy. We can't earn anything he has for us. We have to accept it. And then what ends up happening is we don't live according to a bunch of rules. We live tied to the vine. And so we aren't bound by rules. We're bound by Christ. And so what's amazing about people who are bound by rules is they're always miserable. And yet for some reason they can't live a life of holiness because it's not a about holiness growing closer to Jesus. It's just about rules. But people who are tied to the vine, people who are staying close to Jesus, they end up looking a lot more holy. Why? Because it's not about rules. It's about being as close and as like Jesus as they possibly can. And when that happens, joy fills you like no other because I don't care about the things of this world. I'm just focused on Jesus. There's an amazing preacher, and I don't agree with everything he says. I have to put that out there because I, sometimes I know that I say things that people just go look that person up. And I just tell you right now, there are some things this man believes I don't believe. And that's okay because he has a lot of good things to say. His name is John Piper. John Piper says something that's so profound and so beautiful and so powerful. He says, when Jesus bought his joy at the cross with the price of his death, he also bought ours. I'm going to say it one more time. When Jesus bought his joy at the cross with the price of his death, he also bought ours. You know, people don't want to surround themselves with people who are miserable. People also don't want to surround themselves with people who are fake. Right? And if you're trying to fake joy, it's pretty obvious, right? Right? Like I said, jo joy is not a constant happiness. Do you, you understand that? Joy is not a constant happiness. Joy is a whole completeness. It's, it's, a, it's a feeling of I am who I am in Christ. And that is, that's, I mean, that's solid as a rock. That's stable. And in that, there is happiness. Does that make sense? Yes. What I'm saying? Okay. So what I'm, okay. He's the vine. We're the branches. It's his joy. His joy makes us whole. His joy is our strength. Amen. This Christmas season, I, I, we always talk about it. Christmas, Julie talked about it. She loves Christmas. <laughs> Some people look at 
Jesus and because of the loss they've endured. And in your, in your loss, there is still joy. There, in, 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 your, in your hard Christmas season, there's still, you might not have a lot this Christmas. There's still joy to be found in Jesus, in who he is, in what he's done, and in what he's going to do. I mean, that, that right there is everything. And guess what, church? There is joy when Pastor ends his sermon early. Can I get, can I get the worship team up this morning? I'm going to switch microphones here. This morning, um, this morning, what is, one of the things I always promise to do is I don't promise to over-preach and I, I don't under-preach. I preach what God lays on my heart. So sometimes I come in with a 45-minute message. Sometimes I come in with a 20-minute one. But today, I, I believe with all my heart I hope that you have allowed God to reveal to you what joy really is. It's not about happiness. It's about completeness. It's about wholeness. We, I hope you understand that it's not your joy, but it's His that He gives to you. And, and, and in the midst of all of these things, what we have to understand is that this world needs more joy. Amen. This world needs more Jesus. Because all throughout... Our, our nation, all throughout our world, there is so much turmoil and so much chaos. There is no stability. And why is there no stability? Because there's nothing complete or whole. Well, obviously, that's not going to fully happen until Jesus comes back. We have to understand that about our earth. But what does that do then? That inspires us to understand that we need Jesus. We need his joy. We need his wholeness and completeness that he offers to us. So this Christmas season, this is what I encourage you to do. One, accept the love that God has given to you and then share that love with others. And then two, allow the joy of the Lord to permeate yourself so strongly, so profoundly that in the midst of the chaos of your life, and I know some of you have a lot of chaos going on right now, in the midst of the chaos of your life, you go, you know what? I'm still whole in Jesus. Amen. I've still got joy. I'm not going to let the things of this world, I'm not going to let the distractions or even the evil temptations of this world pull me away because I am whole and complete in Jesus and he is my joy. Let's pray and then we're going to sing a song to close us out this morning. God, we're so thankful for your joy, for Jesus. God, we're thankful for the gifts that you give us. And they're not something we earn. They're not something we work towards. They're something that we accept. God, may we release bitterness so that we can experience joy. God, may we release pain in our lives so that we can experience joy. And God, may we also understand that when we release things, it's not always a complete letting go, but it's a giving it to you. The pain is in your hands, Jesus. God, I, I, I pray that this Christmas season we would be so full of joy that people would wonder why we're smiling so much. God, that we would be so full of joy that people would wonder why we seem to be more confident in who you are and who we are. God, may we walk around with joy. May we walk around with love. May they hang in our hearts, may they hang in our faces, in our body language, in our words. And may you move in us like never before this Christmas season and in continuing on as well. In him I pray. Amen.